we want to like provide this for people so they can trade for life with zero fees you know we are aiming to kind of uplift everyone Mm. with us in line with that we want to make sure that we treat everyone like a vip we're always trying to be transparent Hello everyone, this is Mena, your crypto friend. Today, I'm really excited to have George Hees, the content marketing specialist at Wu Network to join my podcast. We mainly talk about two topics. First, what is Wu Network's mission and its competitive advantages? Second, how to do effective marketing in Web3. Unfortunately, Kevin, the Wufai lead, wouldn't be able to join us this time because of some reasons. Hopefully, he can join us next time. Hi, George. Thank you for joining my podcast today. Hey, Mayna. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm excited. But it's so bad, like, Kevin wouldn't be able to join us because of the, you know, all the political issues. Yeah. Yeah, I wish Kevin could be here. (laughs) <laughs> with his mask on. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk about your personal background a little bit. Like, how did you get into crypto and what what are the fun things that you have done in the space so far? Yeah, so I, I actually got into crypto last year and this was via a friend who told me about uh, Woo Network, which is obviously the company that I, I work for now. Mm-hmm. Um, and he told me about this sort of concept of like uh, an exchange that where you could trade with zero fees. And I was just like absolutely like uh, blown away by the idea. And I started like digging deeper into like Woo Network. And that's where I came across the idea of like CFI and DeFi. And at the time, I was a teacher, so I had like no background in like finance whatsoever. What did you so teach? So it was like really. Uh, so I used to teach. Funny enough, it's <laughs> it's something that you wouldn't expect at all from someone who works in crypto, but it was Latin uh, and like ancient Greek uh, and like classical civilization. So uh, wow. sort of like ancient <laughs> ancient stuff, which is like very far from tech, but. Yeah, I've always been fascinated by like uh, myths and storytelling. And I think that's probably what's like attracted me to like uh, communities. Because mm-hmm. I think a lot of like marketing is about essentially telling narratives and um, yeah, kind of like sharing sharing stories with people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the part I really need to learn from you: marketing, sharing great stories with people. So, like, what what are I guess what are the projects that you worked on so far? If you yeah, don't so, mind sharing. Uh, yeah, sure. So I actually, the first project that I ever worked for was uh, Hashflow, and that was absolutely by chance. It was by a, fr- it was by a, funny enough, the same friend that told me about Woo Network. Um, at the time, I was getting into crypto and I was like writing a lot of threads. So I, what I'd like to do was like deep dive into projects, mm. and then I would like create threads about them to like inform people about like why I believed it was, you know, essentially a great opportunity. So I started creating threads about hash flow. I was diving into how it was MEV resistant, how it was facilitating like uh, swaps with minimal slippage. Um, I was fascinated by it and I decided to apply for the job. And because I'd sort of already knew hash flow really well and established myself as like a member of the community, mm. they decided to like give me a chance. I sort of like did a couple of trials and yeah, it kind of like all went from there. And I ended up being like the social media manager. So that's where I gained experience in like writing tweets, like creating different types of uh, types of content. And yeah, I just kind of fell in love with the whole like Hashbot saga. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> and they are going to do, do their launch soon. So I'm excited for them. <laughs> and I'm also yeah. a Hashbot fan. Okay, I'm a fan. <laughs> oh, that's good to hear. Yeah. Now let's talk a little bit about U Network or Kronos in general, right? So what what is like Wu Network's mission and why do you think it's important? Yeah, sure. So I think like to answer that question, I kind of have to give you just like a very quick introduction to like what Wu Network is. Mm. And it's actually quite hard because I think like compared to other projects, <laughs> Wu is, uh, Wu, Wu comprises so many different things that it can actually be quite hard to understand. But what you can think of it as really is just Uh, at its heart is a liquidity network so Mm. if you think in crypto liquidity is 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 really the lifeblood that makes it work because Mm. you can't you know you can't buy or sell an asset if there's no liquidity Mm. and and what woo network is trying to do is is solve this 
I think what you could call maybe like a liquidity fragmentation problem that exists, right? Mm -hmm. uh, across all of these different ecosystems, you know, what traders need is like a really like easy way to buy and sell assets with the best prices. Mm. And that's what Woo Network is trying to facilitate. And if you can think of it as like all of these exchanges, right? Like they're like rivers. And what they're doing is they're all running into one giant pool. And that giant pool is Woo Network, right? We are we are like the source of all of the flow that flows into <laughs> the ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> I know you guys so, work with a lot of like big DeFi protocols or, or even like exchanges uh, in, in the crypto space. Right. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're very collaborative. You know, there are, you know, what we're aiming to do mm. is as we provide uh, exchanges, institutions and traders with better liquidity, you know, we, we, we're aiming to kind of uplift everyone mm. with us. So it's it's very much like not a selfish approach at all. It's like we actually want to make the space a better place, you know, for, for pretty much everyone involved is, is the idea, Mena. That's very moving. Make crypto a better place. <laughs> I think we were just chatting about like the crypto space is more about collaborating instead of competing with each other because we are so early. <laughs> yeah, like, like it, absolutely. And I think um, mm. the, I think there's like a big issue in crypto, right? Like I think a, a lot of people who are first timers coming into crypto, I think they end up like getting sucked into a, a, a sort of a space of crypto that is filled with like rug pulls, uh, is filled with projects that are pumping and dumping that are mm. just trying to like extract value from mm. people. Mm. And it's it's like not nice at all, right? And it creates a very bad reputation for the industry as a whole, which is that it's very self-serving. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where we're trying to be different. Um, and I said there about uplifting everyone. Mm. Uh, I think the best way that I can tell, you know, sort of like sort of show you that is by sharing like our, our founder, his name is Jack. He has this vision. Uh, we had our one year anniversary literally like uh, last week. <laughs> Where? <he> like a <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we, we had we had like um, an offline meetup in Amsterdam, which mm. was like really cool. But we were also doing like other events. <laughs> but what, one aspect of it was like a personal letter that like Jack wrote. And it was really moving. I think part of it, which like gave me goosebumps, was him talking about this vision that he has which is where like he he believes that like there should be or can be a world where like people don't have to work all the time that like actually there can be a world where we can pursue the things that we love uh and actually really like enjoy our existence mm. and he like deeply from the bottom of his heart believes that like we can like we can play a part in making that happen and i think that's like for me it's such a noble thing that i just you know want to be a part of right mm. Yeah, that's actually very moving and, and utopia. And I I do think a lot of us who are working in the Web3 industry or the, the or anyone else called the crypto space, we are trying to change the world or at least move it to a direction that that we want it to be, right? To shape the world. <laughs> yeah, okay. that hundred percent. I think we you know we want to put power into the hands of people. Mm. Um, and bring about a world where people have, you know, access to financial freedom. And I think I see CFI and DeFi mm. as the gateway into what you described there as this kind of utopia. Mm. Um, and I don't think we will ever, I don't, genuinely don't believe we will ever find this in traditional finance, mm. Um So this is why I want, you know, I feel like it's so exciting to be working on like, you know, the forefront of innovation in crypto. Mm. Mm. Yeah, oh, yeah. At the end of the day, we should never forget that it's all built on blockchain technology. It's a technology revolution. It's nothing else. <laughs> so, so we will move forward once like people see the real benefits, or once we achieve mass adoption. <laughs> One hundred percent. It's mm -hmm. just about overcoming the obstacles that lie in the way. And what makes me laugh, Mainer, is I like often like think about how. Even in the past, when you mm. think about things that are now mainstream, like things that we take for granted, like the internet, mm. you know, I see, I still see videos on my timeline, like going back in time to where people laughed about how the internet like wouldn't take off and how <laughs> they believe that like, they, they used to like say like, why do we need it when we have access to like newspapers and articles uh, and we have phones and you look at it and you think, wow, that is just so interesting to, to see that even with something as this as mainstream as the internet which exists pretty much everywhere even when that was seeing adoption 
there were still individuals that didn't believe that it would work. I think maybe even Tesla is another good example of a company that received a lot of doubt, that people did not believe that right. the future would be full of cleaner cars. <laughs> and, and, and these things where people tend to doubt them, you know, sometimes they do end up being the future. And I don't think any of us can be certain, mm. right, that the future mm. 100% lies in crypto. Mm. But I think everyone in, who does work in crypto does believe it with their entire you know, their entire gut that this is where the future is headed, is the tokenization of digital mm. assets. Um, and this is, this is where it's all headed. Mm. I, I even want to put it into this way. I think if there's something that everybody believed, uh, there's a bigger possibility that it wouldn't come true. But because it's so controversial or because it's like so two-sided, then uh, it almost feels like because we have like different parties have different beliefs. So essentially we will move towards direct, towards that direction. I don't know if that co- statement makes sense to you. No, no, it makes it makes perfect sense, Mayna. Mm. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I think yeah, I think it's just it really is just a matter of time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think what we will eventually see is even things like, I, I would even bet things like pension funds, which you know, we, we, and these are these are bodies right with billions, um, billions of capital that are sat on the sidelines. Mm. I, I still believe that in years to come. We will see even things like this dipping dipping their toes into crypto mm. uh, and starting to invest in it. I think when that happens is probably the point of no return where I think the future definitely kind of almost is certainly going to become um, on the blockchain. Of course. Yeah. Thank you for sharing Wu Networks as well as your own personal vision for, for the crypto space. Um, then uh, I, I think uh, initially when you introduce yourself, right, you, you mentioned about this zero fee trading concept. Um, other exchanges has also started to offer zero fee trading. Do you guys see that as a threat? Yeah, it's this is a this is this is a really interesting observation, right? Um, so if you th- if you think back to the peak mania of the bull run last year. Mm. What, what was happening, right, was we were, we were having um, a real influx of money and people into the space. There were, there were like any number of tokens every day that were soaring in value. There were like opportunities like uh, everywhere for people to make money. And I think in that time, exchanges didn't have to worry about charging fees or they didn't have to worry about turning off the fee switch mm. because there was just like there was so many users that, that this this was not an issue right mm. people were making so much money what why does it matter if for instance uh, on, on, on my swap i'm being charged like a 0.1 percent fee it, mm. a, a lot of people kind of you know didn't didn't mind that but i think now obviously the market is cooling off it's no longer frothy a lot of uh, traders a lot of individuals have either been wrecked uh, in the bull run or they're taking a break, right? Mm. As the market is is essentially receding, they they are they are leaving the scene completely, abandoning it. And I think this has now probably put more power into the hands of traders, investors, as they're looking at exchanges and they're thinking, kind of like lining them up and thinking, like, what is it that you can offer me, right? When when we have an what is becoming an increasingly competitive landscape mm-hmm. with more and more exchanges like <laughs> cropping up all the time i can think of like loads where i look at them and i think they're, they're in a way very similar all they have really is like maybe a, like a tiny difference in fees the ui looks slightly different like what you know why should i put this this exchange over this exchange mm-hmm. um and i think what a lot of exchanges have therefore done is they've tried to essentially differentiate themselves from the masses right mm. through what i would maybe even call marketing employees which is you know what we'll do is we'll turn off fees and this is a great way to like garner interest and entice people over but the thing i think that's the, that we have to remember here is like a lot of these exchanges whilst they're doing this it's only temporary because their business models are built around that are literally built around taking money from their traders this is how they how they generate revenue so what what exchanges are doing is they're actively foregoing taking profits right now mm. and that's not sustainable they can't do this forever mm. so from our standpoint it's not you know i don't think we see it as a threat so much as we see it as something that was inevitable mm. we always believed that the the markets mature markets become more efficient and mm. what what it is essentially a race to the bottom in terms of fees if mm. you look at how every other kind of market has operated fees tend to go towards zero Mm. And this is why we built a zero fee model is because we knew that this was eventually where it would end up. And we've just tried to position ourselves in such a way that we're ahead of the curve. So uh, this is something that we, you know, like 
this is where woo shines because it can do this indefinitely it's not this isn't just like a, a ploy to get people to trade on us for a couple of months we want to like provide this for people so that they can trade for life with zero fees you know so tldr yeah we just don't see it too much as, as, as a threat main it great <laughs> but then essentially what be what will be the competitive advantage like it i mean essentially if if everybody is offering zero fee trading right <laughs> yeah so the way the way the uh, exchanges work there there is no single exchange besides we network that offers zero fees for spot and futures what you'll see is that some exchanges provide zero fees for certain pairs or they'll provide it for spot or they'll provide it just for futures but n- there is no exchange that can that can essentially provide zero fees for for everything that they offer. Mm. And so that is something that Woo Network will always have that no other exchange will. And I think that will always keep us competitive. I think there are other things as well that like differentiate Woo. I wouldn't say these are groundbreaking things, but I do think we have really good customer support. I think we have this like ethos. It's, do you remember what I said about making the world a better place? Mm. In line with that, we want to make sure that we treat everyone like a VIP. Uh, I, I think this is a real uh, I think if we could maybe phrase it in the way of saying that it doesn't matter the size of your wallet or how much volume you move mm. if you if you stake 1-800 Woo on, on Woo X you get to trade like a king whereas on another exchange you might have to move maybe 100 million volume in a month to access essentially like lesser fees and I think we've you know we've always strived to make it so that anyone who wants to better their lives, anyone who wants to learn how to trade, as long as they're staking 1-800-WOO, then they're going to get access to the best prices and the best customer support. Mm. Another thing is downtime. I think this is a, th- a, a must-have for traders. You can't have an exchange that ever goes down, right? Sometimes markets get very, very volatile, mm. especially, I think you can see you see it like uh, last week, right? Doge, Doge was pumping. Uh, massively following uh, Elon Musk's uh, acquiring of Twitter, yeah. right? Yeah. This was like a narrative that everyone was jumping on. In these times, it's it can be possible for exchanges to not cope with the load. The infrastructure can't handle it. The good thing about Wux is that we have very robust infra. So when you know a trader, when when the market gets volatile, they need to be able to enter or exit a position quickly mm-hmm. without you know without fear <laughs> that they're going to be. <laughs> you can, imagine opening a position with twenty x leverage, <laughs> and then your exchange, <laughs> and then your exchange goes down on you, right? Yeah, on a, and on then... a coin. <laughs> it's it's a horrific thought, and it does happen. Yeah, I and, know. And I know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so you want it this is where you know again Buex shines in this regard because we don't we don't have downtime and things like this um mm. so yeah i would say even if even if somehow exchanges were trying to sort of um maybe replicate this zero fee model i don't think they can because they don't have access to a professional market maker like cronus who incubated us mm. you know it's there there aren't like many professional market makers that move the volume that cronus research does um that are sitting around that are actively there who are who can kind of incubate their own exchange um so yeah that'll be my take on it mayna great <laughs> it's good to know you have a strong backer <laughs> Mm. Now that we address the zero fee trading feature of Wu, right? But but then how can Wuex compete with other like centralized exchanges that have NFT marketplaces, launch pads, earn products, and more? This is something that we get asked quite a lot. Mm. Um, it's interesting because you can you could log on to another exchange, mm. and I can think of quite a few off the top of my head that boast it's almost like they're actually more than an exchange uh, you, uh, when you, you might know what I mean here Mena, when you think about these these exchanges when they're, they're, they're building uh, ways for people to communicate on the app with each other mm. they're building earn products they're building like lottery systems it's it's becoming more than an exchange it's, it's almost like an app that you that is encouraging you to visit every day even if you're not actively trading mm. there is a reason to go on there right mm. um Will X doesn't have these shiny bells and whistles. This mm. is this is true. I don't think we can. I don't think we can build the kind of products that quickly that these other exchanges have. Right? Mm. Um, it takes a lot of time to build those. But I actually don't think that we have to have those products at Will X. I think <laughs> my take would be, yeah. I think my take would be, we actually only have to be exchanges on what is the bread and butter. 
mm. of trading. Mm. And like the bread and butter of trading, right, is is it's like pricing, it's price execution, right? Mm. And why why should you trade on for on one exchange rather than another? I think it should be about getting better prices. Like at the end of the day, mm. you know, if you trade on that exchange for a year versus another exchange, mm. are you getting more more money? Mm. Like which one is giving you overall more net profit? Mm. And I think it should be you, 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 you opt for that exchange. Now, there might be other people who are using exchanges for NFT launch pads or whatever, but WUX, I think, has always been catered to traders. I think this has always been like a really firm belief of ours. Mm. It's about traders. So whilst people, this was actually a really interesting thing last year, during the peak of the bull run, we had thousands of people asking us to build an NFT launch pad. Because you remember when <laughs> NFTs were like absolutely taking off? Yeah, booming. And we, yeah, we're like um, the board apes were going for ridiculous prices. Same with uh, the punks. There was, and there was, uh, there were so many collections. I can think of others like pudgy penguins, the squiggles. There are so many. These these were booming, and people wanted these NFT launch pads. But and. But we didn't cave at that time to building something like that because we knew that the focus before you can build anything like that, mm. what you have to have in place is, is, is proper tools and, and, and proper systems in place for traders. I think once you have that, then you can expand to other products, right, and mm. build on top of it. Mm. But that's our belief, Mayna, that we, we don't necessarily have to have these shiny features. We just have to beat exchanges on, on one thing. Uh, and if we can do that, we will always have a USP for people to come and, and, and use WUX. Wow. So, yeah, yeah. I think um, there are different ways to build a business, right? One way is you build one thing, but you be really great at it. The other one is like you have very diversified products so that like it fulfills people's different needs enough so that they will keep using it. Um, yeah, I'm not, I, 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 and I, I do understand your perspective or Wu's perspective in that. <laughs> 100%. You phrase it very well there, Mayna. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, and I think WUX definitely sits on the side of, of focusing on doing one thing very well. <laughs> now let's talk about WUFA a little bit. Because uh, I know you guys, Wu Network has also tried to be tapping more into the DeFi space. So how is WUFI differentiated from other decentralized exchanges? Like what, what are your competitive advantages or what are the things that you're trying to do differently? Yeah, it's a good question. So I think maybe the best way to frame this is by looking at the, mm. the sort of the landscape of DeFi. And if we if we think of it as that there are almost now, I think more than 180 different decentralized exchanges that, mm. that operate in DeFi. It's like, it's it's growing and it's growing and it's growing. Mm. And what you'll find is that most of these, these DEXs, right? Mm. They are typically powered by automated market makers. So they're essentially using smart contracts to like provide 24 seven liquidity mm. for the buying and selling of their assets, right? Mm -hmm. um, that is, I would say most of DEXs in DeFi. There are some who use an RFQ model, who are, what they're doing is they're essentially getting quotes from professional market makers, which they are, which are, which is happening off chain. And what these, these decks are doing is they're bridging it on chain and they're, they're connecting essentially users with professional market makers. And then there's WuFi, which uh, actually has its own model, which we call SPMM, mm. um, which, which stands for synthetic proactive market making. <laughs> and it's, yeah, it sounds nerdy, but it's actually super exciting. And what, what it's essentially doing is our uh, WuFi is simulating the liquidity mm. of our centralized exchange, WuX. So you can imagine on a centralized exchange like WuX, what we have is like really deep aggregated liquidity, right? What mm. WUX does is we have liquidity coming from Kronos, who is like the market maker behind WUX. They're moving like, let's say, five billion a day. Mm. Loads of liquidity is coming from there. Mm. We're also aggregating liquidity from exchanges. Yeah? Mm. So think of big names, big name exchanges. This is where it's flowing from. What mm. we're doing is we're redirecting that that, that liquidity mm. straight into DeFi. Yep. And I think this is super exciting because the difference between an AMM and let's say our SPMM liquidity mm. is that you're getting essentially CFI grade pricing on mm. those swaps, mm. right? So whilst you may be able to go to a DEX that's powered by an MMM and you can swap basically any coin or let's say like it's a meme coin, mm -hmm. it could be a shit coin, whatever it is, you can mm -hmm. swap it because it provides, you know, it provides uh, liquidity for thousands of coins. The difference is that WuFi provides liquidity for a select number of coins. It's much smaller, but on those assets, what you'll get is 
extremely better price execution, right? Mm. And that's especially attractive for someone who's a trader who moves large amounts of volume every day. Mm. That you'll get much, much, much less slippage, and you could be saving essentially yeah, vast amounts of money with BlueFi.、Mm. But but I think essentially it. The slippage or the price will not be able to compete with centralized exchanges, at least for now. Well, fun, the funny thing is, right? So the the, the pricing on Wufi, let's so let's say you're buying, let's say you're buying Matic, and you're you're buying that through Wufi.、Mm. The price for Matic is it will be exactly the same that it is on Wuex. The、mm. only difference would be that you're having to pay. Uh, the gas, gas fee, fee, right,、yeah. on, on on top of it.、Mm. But the thing is, again, with Wufi, we're constantly striving to innovate and find new ways to, let's say, let you keep more of what you earn.、Mm. And Kevin, who is the lead for Wufi, who sadly couldn't be here today, has come <laughs> up with a re- he, he's come up with a really interesting strategy where he's essentially made it possible for us to slash gas prices in half.、Mm. We're calling this SPMM V two. And it's essentially going to be a new chapter in the history books of Wu,、mm. where essentially our pricing is about to get even more competitive. So it's it still won't be in line with the exact prices that you'll find on, on a kex because of the gas. But we are slowly working our way to like getting that gas as small as it can be. I wonder、when? if in the future this is we can say manner when. When?、Mm. <laughs> so this、uh, SPMM V2 is going to go live literally on Monday,、uh, and this is super exciting because it, <laughs> it will be in it will be in line with our next big launch, where we're moving、uh, further into the、e- Ethereum ecosystem. So we'll be launching on Arbitrum,、uh, which is obviously like a real hot spot at the moment. I don't know if you've been following Arbitrum, Mayna, but、uh, yeah, the, the ecosystem has become a real hot spot. Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course, I have been following Arbitrum. <laughs> <Yeah> . Part two. <laughs> Now let's talk about marketing, which I think is what you are very good at. Marketing crypto. I think lots of people have questions about it. So,、uh, before we talk about like what are the effective strategies that you have adopted, let's talk about what are the common or what are the obstacles that you are facing so far with Wufi. Yeah, so I think one one thing that I notice in particular is sort of other projects, maybe maybe who have deeper pockets, sort of making these sort of large、uh, splashes of cash to get like large amounts of attention. So I think like good examples、Super、would be like. Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, say again. What is it? Super Bowl. Yeah, that's、Crypto. it. Crypto. Like, Com. <laughs> Buy, buying arenas,、uh, sponsoring football teams.、Yeah. I see this like all the time happening on crypto,、mm. and I feel like what people latch onto very quickly、mm. is these these like these big acts like this,、mm. right?、Um, and I think as as a company that's 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 still kind of maturing,、uh, that this you know we're yet to be like a top five centralized exchange. I think we kind of you know we probably still see ourselves as kind of like being. Like a tier two exchange,、mm. you know, we're definitely not tier one at the moment. I don't think we kind of have the cash to compete with, like, you know, let's say acts like that. So we kind of have to, let's say, think outside the box a bit more、mm. and think about ways to onboard users in a way where we're not just splashing cash all the time.、Mm. I think that actually requires like a lot of resourcefulness. It requires a lot of strategic thinking on essentially how to how to like get mind share in the market and. It's really tough, especially when you already have like a lot of users who are on exchanges. Do you, do you know what I mean, Mena? When I say there's almost in in all of us, there's this like inherent fear of trying new things.、Mm. Uh, I feel like this exists in everyone. Like a good example would be think about someone who goes to work every day. You know,、mm. who works a nine to five job.、Mm. They have one route they go to work,、mm. and there probably are different. Routes that they could go. Maybe they could get diff- a different, you know, different trains on the subway, or they could take different roads by、mm. car. But they don't do it、mm. because they figured out or, one way、yeah. to do it, yeah. and, and they're comfortable with it.、Yes. And they're not going to change their ways. And this is, I think, the challenge for us from a marketing perspective is when you already have exchanges that, let's say, occupy、uh, maybe even like fifty percent of like the the, the the total share of the market. Mm. Is giving people a reason to move away when they're already comfortable.、Mm. So I would say these are probably two of the greatest challenges that we're that we're facing. Mainer is overcoming that that inherent fear of trying something new in people,、mm. whilst also trying to cut through the noise in what is becoming an increasingly like loud 
space. It's human nature. It's psychology, and and you're right. Everybody is like that. I I sometimes will fall into my comfort zone, but、uh, as a YouTuber or more like an influencer,、uh, I have to try different products to 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 actually know what what features are offered. But I think for Regular people, they they don't have that need, so they will just use whatever they are comfortable with. So essentially, it's how you provide a motivation. Like the motivation is strong enough for them to to be willing to change to you or、yeah. to at least try the new product. And 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 you get a very lean chance because if they have something they already like, and if they are motivated, let's say by some small incentive to try the new thing, but. But if they are not impressive enough, they will switch back essentially. Yes, the the you've nailed you've nailed it on the head, and I think as well there's an element of trust involved here, Mayna, which、mm. is another challenge. I think we touched briefly on how crypto can often be perceived as quite a dangerous place if you don't know what you're doing. Yeah, it's very scary as a user to like move your funds onto a project that you haven't done deep research on. We've seen. Over the past couple of months, like a series of unfortunate incidents that have happened,、yeah. I think you know a, a good example would be, for instance, like Mango. You know,、uh, I I remember waking up one day、yeah. and it, it transpired that the yeah the yeah, the, the majority、remember. of funds in Mango DAO had、yeah. just been overnight just drained、yeah. right, through a simple exploit. I I、That's、covered that news. Oh my god,、mm. it's I, extremely <laughs> yeah scary. I heard a lot. I even like heard about. Founders, or let's say the partners at different VCs, they got hacked like n- numerous times, three or four times. So, so it's it's actually very scary, not only for regular people, but also for crypto insiders, for for us builders. Yeah. So, yeah.、Uh, the the bottom line, I think, is everybody still has to be very cautious because there are bad players out there, and because the regulations are not that complete yet. So it's easier for them to conduct crimes or try to hack different things to benefit them, right? Yeah, absolutely, Mayna. <laughs> so now we have talked about the problem. Let's address how we should solve it. Like how to do effective marketing in crypto. I I want both of us to share our insights, and、um, but I want to hear from you first. I think first of all. The the main approach that we've always taken to marketing is first of all taking a very global approach. So we've made a concerted effort, not just to target English speaking communities, but recognise that actually there are so many like areas around the world where crypto is booming. And I think a good example of this, for instance, is Turkey.、Mm. I think over the course of the crypto winter, the amount of users that are still interacting with crypto is、uh, it's like sky high. I believe it's something over fifty percent of. Individuals、mm. over this over like the、uh, autumn period so far、mm. have either bought or sold crypto, which、mm. is absolutely insane. And you know what we're doing、uh, at Wu Network is making sure that we're supporting the the growth of crypto in these countries、mm. by having our own like localized regions. So, for instance, we have Wu Network Turkey,、mm. who over there like we've got like our own app, which is、uh, Wu XTR,、mm. where Turkish users can buy and sell crypto with zero fees.、Mm. And we also have.、Um, A community empowerment program called、mm. Wu Force,、mm. where we're even penetrating、uh, areas of the world as far as Nigeria.、Mm. And a good example of this is recently、uh, our community held a a basically like an offline meetup、mm. in Lagos, and there was like a, a a huge amount of people who turned up, all who came to like learn about crypto, how about about how Wu Network is trying to better people's lives. Let them keep more of their funds.、Uh, so what we're what we're trying to do first of all is yeah make sure that we have a a, a a very global approach to marketing. And I think the other thing as well, we're always trying to be transparent. And I think I've、mm. sort of the best way to explain this is that I think a project lives and dies by its community.、Mm. This is what I completely stand by.、Mm. I have witnessed so many projects that are flavor flavor of the month fade into existence. Uh, maybe six months later, and、mm. they're just gone. There's no trace of them. They have died out.、Mm. I think it's because they don't care about their community. They, mm. Maybe they're extracting value, right?、Mm. They're not actually、mm. fostering the ties、uh, to,、mm. to 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 keep people with them.、Mm. And I think what we've always done is made a concerted effort within our marketing、mm. to make sure that we're building relations with people. I think you have to build products that resonate. 
ultimately it has to tell a story it has to chime with the user mm -hmm. and i think what we've ultimately tried to do is make that very clear in our mission make it clear that what we're trying to do like i explained to you about building this better place and i think that's something that like everyone can believe in right mm. if you think about the most successful companies in the world they tend to have very simple mission statements that resonate with people and i think this is what we're trying to do at we network is make people see the world through the way that we see it which is you know what it currently is and where it could be mm. if we can kind of work together so i'd say yeah those kind of three things mm, that's great i uh i think that's that also echoes what i i wanted to say it's it's almost very similar to build uh, or create a, a major audience for my YouTube channel or for my Twitter space, for my Twitter account. Essentially, I'm, I'm also trying to build the, the trust between myself or whatever the information I'm providing to the users and my community, people who like me. Um, but but the, the main difference, I, I guess, for me or versus a, a DeFi protocol or a specific project in the crypto space is uh, I'm, I'm more building trust me uh, uh, I'm more towards building the trust of the audience on me instead of like a specific product but 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 now I, I need to treat myself as a product right or I need to treat treat the the videos I'm creating the content I'm creating as my core product so go, it goes back or to how do I frame this? How do I tell a good story so that not only the users, they they have fun watching the video, but also they are getting useful information, accurate information, precise information from that sense. What, what you say there <laughs> makes so much sense, Mayna. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I firmly believe that you can build a, a community mm -hmm. or a loyal user base, not just with a killer product, but by having someone who is giving their life and soul to mm -hmm. that product because people can also believe in a person mm -hmm. as much as they believe in a product and i think you, you know this is where this whole idea of a cult cult personality right mm -hmm. comes into play mm -hmm. when you think about maybe projects that have seen particular success sometimes there is one face of that project right, right. one individual who is uh driving <laughs> it you know it is essentially that 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 person that project is that person's child mm. and they are giving it all of their attention and love and i think this is something that people tend to uh tend to love because what we believe or what we like to believe is that that individual is going to give their lifeblood they're going to give every single ounce of energy that they have into making that project a su success mm. and i think you see this a lot in marketing where what projects try to do is they try to purport the image that they're they're working 24 7 right that mm. it's it's this isn't nine till five this is 24 7 mm. this is seven days a week mm. on weekends i'm in the office on weekends mm. I'm, I'm not with my family right on thanksgiving i'm 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 building the future of France, right? This is <laughs> this is what they're trying to do. And mm. uh, funny enough, this was actually what uh, one of the things which uh, I used to love about Wu was Ben, who was our VP of marketing. Mm. Um, I always had the perception that he never slept. <laughs> <laughs> that like literally, like the like the man was just grinding always. Mm. And I think everyone in the Wu community believes that this is true, mm. and it's something that which we all kind of how should we say, look to as like a beacon is mm. knowing that, that, you know, we're safe in Ben's hands. I think this is, this is how we put it, right? And it's the same reason why other people like other projects. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's about human interactions. Why should someone trust you, like, all over the internet? It's, it's because you have delivered consistently, efficiently over a long period of time, and you are constantly trying to understand their needs and adapting to their needs, listen to them. So it, I, I think it's really psychology. Marketing is really about psychology, <laughs> right? Yes, I think, mm -hmm. um, I think Steve Jobs understood this very well. Mm. Uh, people often say that, you know, Apple was such a success because Steve Jobs knew what people wanted before they even knew it themselves. Mm. And I think this is, that has always struck a chord with me. Um, you saying about psychology, I firmly believe this is true. Mm. It's about understanding the needs of people. It's understanding about what it is that they're looking for. Mm. It's understanding about how to communicate things in a way that people A, understand, B, believe in, and C, mm. uh, 
maybe resonate with it's it's all of that um mainly you have to be able to understand people if you don't understand people i don't believe you can succeed in marketing right mm, right so now uh we, we talk about the core philosophy or the core main drive behind marketing let's talk about what well what are the effective tactics that that worked so well in in the crypto market so far yeah, so I think like one of the things that we that the woo has done quite well is if, for instance, like if you looked at the way we communicate on Twitter. Now, mm. Twitter is, I would definitely say, is arguably the hub for crypto followers, right? Mm. Crypto Twitter is where the majority of native uh, crypto users reside. Mm. It's where they get their their information from, and I I actually believe what we what we see or what's happening is that before a user decides to invest in a project or actively follow them they must first digest their social media Mm. they must look at it and they have to essentially uh well they have to like it they have to Mm. it has to connect with them somehow Mm. and i don't think you can't do that if you're tweeting like you know like a robot right if you're just doing like announcements right uh like with a megaphone just this is happening this is happening i don't think that attract anyone like and it's, it's it, what you have to do is you have to speak in a language which is familiar to people mm, right mm. like 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 there is a person behind that twitter account it's not a company mm. there is a person there and they want to talk to you and mm, they want to mm. build a relationship and i think with that comes like it means having fun right mm. it means like making memes it means in particular <laughs> scenarios <laughs> it means not being entirely serious but i think with that comes a challenge as well it's about like continually adapting and acting quickly mm. because in crypto twitter opportunities arrive and they go very quickly it's con- things are continually happening so you might see the one trend is happening within six hours if you're engaging with it like if you're trying to join in the meme it's kind of you're already late mm. you have to um constantly have your finger on the pulse right and be uh watching what's happening so and 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 move and adapt with trends so i would say that's something that um yeah something that we've done very well with twitter and i think also it's about having consistent content you've Mm. got to you've got to constantly engage people Mm. if you're not tweeting like two three times a day it's just not enough Right. Oh, it's... you broke my heart. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, but good advice. I, 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 I say that because you know hmm. w- w- you want people to keep coming back. There needs Why to be a is constant... it two to three times a day? <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> hey, that's just personal opinion. Um, okay. it's, 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 you know, certain projects might not do that, but I think one thing that one thing at Woo that we we do very well is and i don't think it's not it's not an image it is very much the truth that we're continually working right it's like you have these things to constantly tweet out right oh you know we've got this new product but well, let's get the tweet out uh we've made an optimization here let's get the tweet out we've got mm. a space is coming again tweet so you, you're just constantly pumping out this this mm. this content and i think as you grow in followers the network effect starts to enact mm. and you start to get a wider and wider reach um so i think the challenge to be honest is, is is hardest at the start but once you start to grow and you're you know you're you're getting more and more followers it starts to compound i know but but it's very hard for me to tweet two to three times a day <laughs> As I a... don't tweet on my, I don't tweet on my personal, you know, because because I'm so involved, for instance, in the Woo Twitter, I find it like very mentally, it's very mentally exhausting to like be quite creative all the time. So it's like at the end of the day, <laughs> my brain is often like frazzled, and I, I won't want to tweet on my personal. So it's like most will come out on the official I, account. Uh, yeah, I have, I I don't have a personal. <laughs> my personal is my public. <laughs> 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 mm. uh, now that we talk about the tactics for conducting effective marketing in crypto let's talk about the question i think a lot of those founders want to know is where can we find good marketing people what are the criteria that we look for when we do the interviews yeah so i think i think it depends on who you're looking to hire so for instance if you're if you're an organization and you're looking for a talented copywriter mm and you're you're a web three organization i think the best thing that you can do is post on twitter and ask for someone to post either their funniest meme or their funniest tweet 
and look for there in, in that way you can look for someone who kind mm. of has that let's say that tongue-in-cheek kind of uh, attitude mm. who can think outside the box mm. but also you know if, if they can make you laugh i think that's a good bet that they can probably make other people laugh right, right. Uh, so i would say do that and then go from there maybe schedule an interview mm. and see what that person is like mm. if you're looking to hire someone who's maybe more um has a more of an analytical mind maybe this is someone who you, whom you're looking to get involved with seo mm. or keep track of data and improve performance over time uh, i think this is not the kind of person typically that you're going to find that this, ter- this person might lurk on ct but i don't believe that this is the way that you would hire them is through twitter i think this would just be through normal traditional methods mm. um and i would be looking in that person for them to show me that they have a way to take the marketing of my products to the next level i would be looking for them to first of all showcase an interest or an understanding of what my products were mm. because i firmly believe that that person to succeed in, in my company would need to have an interest in, in what it is that we're doing. They would need to believe in the mission, but also that they would be able to problem solve mm. and see things in a way that other people can't, right? Mm. And I think you get you, you are able to pick up a lot of this just through talking to someone. Mm. You have to be able to see their face. And you have to sustain the conversation with them. Mm. And you can pick up a lot just from talking to someone, looking at their body language mm. and just digesting the way that they see things. <laughs> the way you say it is kind of scary. <laughs> digesting their body language and their facial expression. <laughs> but but, but I, I, I know what you're talking about. When I interview people, I definitely will watch out their body language where they're looking at. Are they very focused people or, or are they more spreading their thoughts out those kind of things <laughs> uh, yeah. detail oriented <laughs> now let's talk about how do you view the future of crypto and where does who network sits within that future yeah this is something that i give a, a lot of thought to sometimes because i think it's we all want to know where where we're headed right like where is this going to end up the way i I see one way of things ending up is the industry may become a lot more efficient. And I think what you can see already happening is Mm. you see this in wallets. If you look at what wallets are doing, you'll notice they're trying to become these kind of super apps, right? Where (laughs) we're we're, 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 (laughs) yeah. Please continue. We're trying to we're trying to get rid of all the friction. It's all headed towards making things as easy as possible. It's like cars, right? Like you could almost always say that like even like from the moment the first car car was born, Mm. we knew where this was headed, right? Mm. This was about cars becoming sustainable. Mm. This was about cars becoming self driven. Everything tends to optimize and become easier for the individual until it almost operates itself, right? right? So what I what I see happening is we have so many fragmented projects right now across so many fragmented chains. I think what will happen is we may ha- end up having some form of omni-chain where you can almost access any project on any chain seamlessly, where it's like a, a, a foundation layer on which maybe everything resides, mm. right? Because I think what we're trying to do now is we have all these silo chains and individual projects are all trying to build their bridges across Mm. and i think what we're yet to see is one project to come in and it will it will do this i think aggregation (laughs) (laughs) yeah it's it it is like aggregation i I still believe we're yet to see that project right Mm. i don't think it's going to be like um every project is going to solve this with their own like you know let's say their own cross-chain solutions Mm. i think we'll have one thing which unites it all together Mm. you'll have maybe one foundation layer of liquidity Mm. I think we can play a part in providing that liquidity. Um, and I think on, in these kind of super apps, this is where people are going to be able to swap, earn, uh, but lend, borrow, it's kind of do scary, anything though. that you could do in DeFi from one app. Yeah. right and there'll be like no fees uh, <laughs> it will all it will you know how like you could still send like um you could still send funds to the wrong address on metamask just by like accidentally removing a digit right you could just lose ten thousand mm. dollars these are all things that are so crude which will not be here in two years 
everything will be so much different. We'll have regulations in place. We'll be working much more closely to reg uh, with regulators being held to higher standards. I think we'll see less rug pulls. I think we'll see higher quality projects. I think that the, 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 the sort of self-serving projects will die out. I think the project will become a much better space uh, where we have you know, good actors. And I think crypto will be much easier to use to the point where even like your gran, your your granny, you know, she'll be able to come on. She'll, she, it'll be so simple. It will be like her, you know, doing her Tesco shop online. It will be, it will be that simple. But then what will Wu Network lie was in that? Oh yeah, Wu Network. So I think Wu Network will always be uh, the, the sort of liquidity that can power this, right? Wu, Wu's liquidity already has proven itself to be essentially a, a a source of power for loads of different exchanges without which they wouldn't be able to provide the kind of prices that they're able to give to their users mm. that liquidity always has to come from somewhere <laughs> this isn't something you know and and i think th there is differences in the quality of liquidity and there will always be a need for the best in class liquidity mm. and i think Wu network like i genuinely believe you know, in five years time, in 10 years time, like we're here to stay. We don't want to go anywhere. I think that we will continue to essentially provide, I think, exchanges, institutions, individuals mm. with liquidity. That's something that's never, ever going to change. Mm. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. <laughs> so usually for all my guests, I will ask them to share a, a personal fun fact. Now it's your turn, George. <laughs> <laughs> a personal fun fact. Mm. So I think probably one of the worst things that I've done in crypto was convincing my dad to to, to buy in at the peak of the bull at the peak of the bull run. Oh my so <laughs> my my dad, I got my dad to buy Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, Solana, and Wu near the peak of the bull run, and uh, yeah, he, well, he still holds all of it today because I told him not to sell it. So that's probably one of my biggest regrets. And I always tell him that it's going to go back up. And I tell him not, not to check his, his savings ever. Um, but yeah, that's probably one of the worst things that I've done. Okay. Do you feel bad now? Um, I think... Uh, I don't think I feel bad because I, I my dad my dad operates on a long-term horizon. And I, you know, obviously believe that in the next couple of years that... The bull market will come back, and things will, you know, things will, things will pick up. The market will get frothy in in a couple of years' time. That narrative will, will shift back, where suddenly we'll all be geniuses again. You know, this is this is how it always works. The cycle repeats uh, ad infinitum. So, you know, it's not great for him at the moment, but I think things will come fine in, in a couple of years' time. Okay, yeah, maybe you can send him some gifts to say you're sorry. <laughs> 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 Anyways, thank you for sharing that, and then I'll make sure the audience gets it. So never give anyone financial advice, okay? Especially to your friends or family. Even they ask me, I I will say, do your own research and be careful. You might lose all your money. <laughs> that's it. Always, always end every sentence with NFA DYOL. That's, that's how you do it. <laughs> Very responsible YouTuber, Mayna. Ha, ha, ha.